Good morning. Welcome to CSIS. I'm uh, Andy Cutchins, director of the Russia and Eurasia program here, and it's a great pleasure to be uh, chairing uh, this statesman forum and hosting uh, the head of the Georgian Parliament, Mr. David Bakradze. Uh, Mr. Bakradze <coughs> is a uh, longtime friend here at CSIS, uh, most recently speaking here in September of 2008. Uh, it's nice to welcome you back here, uh, sir, in a somewhat more calm moment than uh, uh, 11, months, 11 months ago. Uh, uh, Mr. Bakradze uh, is one of the truly most distinguished and experienced uh, Georgian diplomats uh, and politicians. He's uh, formerly served as a Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, <coughs> and served a number of uh, positions, uh, including uh, uh, in been involved in 2007 as chief negotiator for Abkhazia and South Ossetian affairs, uh, and he, uh, for four or five years in the uh, earlier part of uh, this this decade, uh, he held a number of positions, particularly dealing with security issues, military security, uh, for for Georgia. Um, since time is short, I won't uh, spend uh, much more time with uh, introducing our very distinguished guest, except to note, uh, I was. Uh, Rather uh, uh, pleased to see that you've been named as Graduate of the Month in March of 2009 from the German Marshall Center, uh, a distinction that is maybe not always noted uh, when you speak here. Uh, he's here in a, on one of his regular trips to Washington, at a, and we're really pleased that you've been able to take up some time in your busy schedule. I know he's met with uh, General Jones, the National Security Council, and Bill Burns in the State Department, and uh, a number of other uh, leading figures in the Obama administration. And uh, we look forward very much to what you have to say today about the current uh, challenges that Georgia faces. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew, for this introduction and uh, kind words. I don't know how experienced I am, but at least, you know, it was uh, very pleasant to listen to you, how, how nicely you introduced me, and it's really a pleasure to be back here. Uh, indeed, the moment, I think, is more calm than it was 11 months ago, but still uh, we have challenges at every moment. Well, like any country, and Georgia is not an exception. So I'll try to uh, concentrate on a few areas where we see, I mean, which we see are important for the country at the moment, and then I hope there will be questions, and I'm ready to take those questions. So the first area where I'd like to uh, concentrate is related to Georgia's internal uh, politics and internal political developments because for many of you who have been following Georgian issues uh, this was truly a turbulent and very dynamic political year in the country with uh, with lengthy and quite massive uh, opposition protest demonstrations in the streets of Tbilisi and that was broadly covered by international media so what is our assessment of that I mean what happened this year in in, in, in the streets of Tbilisi I mean is very important for Georgia because of a few different reasons. In order to understand that, I mean, let me give you a very brief uh, historic overview of Georgian, of some specifics of Georgian political mentality. And this specifics is that in Georgian political mentality, uh, the street demonstrations and street actions are, are seen as the only and best way how changes can be delivered in the country and how changes may occur. And this has its own reasons. Starting from 1988, every uh, change in the country in internal politics occurred as a result of street rallies and demonstrations. So in 1988, we had huge anti-Soviet protests in the streets of Tbilisi. Then Soviet Union uh, disappeared. Well, not only because of that, of course, but in, in the minds of Georgians, uh, I mean, the, the dissolution of Soviet Union is very closely associated with this huge anti-Soviet rallies in the streets of Tbilisi. Of course, that contributed to that, but of course, there were other reasons as well. But still, that, that was the first result of uh, uh, street demonstrations, disappearance of Soviet Union in our mentality. Then we had first elected president in Gamsakhurdia, who had to flee in 1992, 1991, sorry, as a result of uh, the same demonstrations in the street. And that time, it turned violence, and we had civil war and civil confrontation. So the first elected president had to flee. Then we had second elected president, Shevard Nadze, who had to resign as a result of the same street demonstrations and protests in 2003, 
that time it was peaceful, so that time it was this well-known Rose Revolution. Then we had third elected president, uh, Saakashvili, who had to step down and appoint snap presidential elections in 2007 as a result of the same street actions and demonstrations, the very same place, and that's called the Rustaveli Avenue, that's the main avenue, and everything what I described is happening on the small spot in front of the building of parliament, which is the very sacred place of Georgian politics. So then 2007, Sagash really had to step down because of the clash between police and demonstrators and the point snap election. So basically we had three presidents, three elected presidents, and one had to flee, second had to resign, third had to step down as a result of street demonstrations. So in our mentality, this street action is seen as something, you know, most efficient and effective whenever one wants to conduct internal politics. And that's, that's the problem. I mean, the problem is not, uh, the demonstrations are not problem per se, because that's, that's, that's a natural way how people express their satisfaction or dissatisfaction, and that's part of democratic life. But the problem starts when these demonstrations become the main and only tools how politics are conducted, and then it's problematic because it, it also explains few reasons, few specifics of Georgian internal politics. One, one is, I mean, a very bad tradition of deep polarization between different political forces and in the society in Georgia. And the reason for polarization, one of the reasons is exactly this tradition of uh, radical street protests because you know when part of the society stands in the streets and part of the society remains in the houses that's the way how it is polarized and you know this this tradition of uh, aggressive and active street protests of course leads to polarization and it leads to the split of the society that's one of the re reasons the second the second bad habit is uh, I mean quite radical behavior of Georgian politicians again you know if your main uh, if, if your main audience is people standing in the street, you have to be tough, you have to be radical in your statements, you have to prove that you are the guy, you are the tough guy, you know, because the people in the street, crowd in the street usually does not accept moderate and reasonable rhetoric. What they want to hear, they want to hear something real and special for which they stand in the street. So, I mean, for many Georgian politicians, you know, addressing people in the street, I mean, was, was the reason and is the reason of being being, uh, being uh, radical in their statements and missing some communicative skills when it comes to, I mean, real political life within the institutions or political consultations within the institutions. So there are a number of other reasons why we believe that, I mean, this, uh, this way of conducting politics is, is, is quite immature for country and at certain point our politics should move up and upgrade to a normal political life, which means that normal political process within the institutions. And the main risk related to this street uh, action mentality is that any political leader who has ambition and power to bring 10 or 20,000 people in the street in front of this uh, building of parliament then has an ambition that he or she is the one who should, I mean, define how things develop in the country. And we have, of course, non-stop chain of these political leaders who can and who want bring people to the street. So, I mean, many, many things which, which happen in, in Georgian internal politics, this all the time, this internal turbulences, this polarization, I mean, many other things are rooted in the tradition of delivering changes from the street. So what happened this year was another attempt, you know, to continue the story and uh, uh, to, to have second time elected third president, you know, resign again or step down again as a result of street rallies. So in that sense, it was very important. It was a test for Georgian state, whether we remained, whether state remained as it was a few years ago or state became stronger and more vibrant so that state and political system and bureaucracy could survive this kind of shock. And what is very important, it appeared that, you know, state, state apparatus, bureaucracy, uh, political system, it survived this kind of shock because what happened this spring was the lengthiest uh, protest demonstrations in my memory. Even, even during the Rose Revolution, we didn't have such a lengthy period of street demonstrations and rallies. So, I mean, it was really a very important test, test of maturity for the Georgian political system and for the state, and it survived. So in that sense, it, it was very, very important. And the result, how these demonstrations ended, I believe is very important for the future. The way that they ended peacefully and the way that they ended without a major 
uh, compromise, it was very important, and I'll explain you why. Because, you know, this is a good deterrence, good prevention for the future. So if any politician today decides to go as radical as, I mean, we have seen this spring or in previous years, he will think twice because now everybody sees that bringing people to the street is not enough. Now everybody sees that blocking streets is not enough. Now everybody sees that standing in the street even for 120 days as it lasted is not enough. And there is something more necessary to be successful and to deliver uh, results. So that's a very good deterrence, not only for current non-parliamentary opposition, but for everybody. I mean, at a certain point, when, when, when we as a majority go to opposition, I will remember experience of spring 2008, and I will really think twice before organizing something like that again, because then the question is, if I cannot deliver something out of these demonstrations, why should I bring these people to the street? Because then it discredits me. So for every politician in the country, I mean, in current opposition, in future opposition, this is a good lesson learned, that there is something else needed and it no longer works like it worked in 2003 or 1991 or 1988. So in that sense, it was a very good lesson. On the other hand, you know, this lesson is not enough. And I mentioned that, you know, it's good that it's ended without a major compromise. Uh, and I'll explain this point. So the, our uh, objective as a government or as a majority was not only to end these uh, rallies peacefully, but it, it was tactical objective. That the strategic objective was to end these rallies in a way which would serve as a deterrence for the future and, and which would serve as an example and lesson for all politicians that this is not enough and the way should be chosen. So for that, one thing is that this rally is ended peacefully and without compromise, but second thing is that alternative should be offered because without alternative, this lesson would not be learned and will not be learned. So this alternative is dialogue. And we talked so much about dialogue and di dialogue. If one counts how many times I used the word dialogue in those five months, I, I think that was the most frequently used, used word. And, you know, there were a lot of jokes and a lot of stories and even some songs, you know, about this word dialogue in, in, in Georgian folk culture. Because, you know, but, but that's, that's, that's what it was. I mean, and the lesson learned from the street protest that it's no longer successful has to be converted into another lesson, that what generates results is normal political process, which is based on dialogue. And if politicians want to achieve something, they should learn not to stand in the street all the time, but to sit around the same table and talk to each other. It's not pleasant at all. I, I mean, I, I acknowledge that. And I have to do a lot of that because of my position. And I should say that it's not pleasant at all. And it's not easy at all. It's very difficult. But it's the only way because people should learn that this is how normal political life is conducted. I mean, dialogue, political consultations, and political process. And I think we are on the right way, on the right path with that regard. Because what we offered before these rallies, during and especially after the rallies, was an issue-based dialogue on certain specific issues. And uh, there was from the beginning part of opposition which agreed to be part of this process. And now we have positive trend that some parties belonging to this uh, non-parliamentary or uh, I mean radical opposition as they are sometimes called are also joining this process because they saw that these street protests were fruitless so now they decided that they will join this political process so what we're talking about some major things which we offered one point was um, uh, constitutional reform because in Georgia there has been uh, continuous debates for years and years that uh, Georgian system of checks and balances uh, is, uh, is not uh, really well balanced. And uh, the presidential institute is too strong, parliament is too weak. So there have been a lot of uh, political parties, opposition parties, arguing that, you know, that there is a certain disbalance in terms of checks and balances in our constitution. And the offer was that, okay, this is an issue which we can discuss and which we should discuss, but let's do it in normal way. So let's set up a structure which will work on the constitutional amendment and which will elaborate a new model of checks and balances. So what the offer was basically to create, to establish a special constitutional commission, to invite all political parties to that commission, to invite civil society and NGOs, and to invite lawyers and academicians. And the right way was not to, not to I mean, talk all the time about this disbalance from the street, but to sit 
in the room to invite all these respected people, politicians, civil society, academicians, to invite all these people and to give them time and mandate to work out the new model of checks and balances. So, okay, this commission is there. People are there. They sit, they work, and whatever their recommendations are, then we, as a majority from the beginning, committed ourselves that we will adopt that uh, through the parliament, in the parliament. So I think that's a good example how, how, how issues are solved and how the good working process should be designed. So uh, sometimes I'm asked what will be the recommendation of that commission. I have no idea and I should not have any idea because it's not my commission. This is commission which works itself. So whatever is, I may agree, I may not agree, but it will be politically suicidal for us not to accept what this commission recommends later. So, I mean, by that, we factually commit ourselves that we will agree. So every political party now has a chance to go there to prove that their vision is right, okay, and come up with, with recommendations. I mean, there is overwhelming consensus that parliament should be stronger, and I think that one of the... I mean, first recommendations of this commission will be to make Parliament stronger. But when it comes to details, again, I cannot say at the moment what will be the details. I mean, which rights will be added to Parliament, how it will be balanced, what will be position of President and Government vis-à-vis -vis Parliament. This is something which should be decided inside Commission. But I support and I agree that Parliament should be stronger, and I think there is the overwhelming understanding in the country, in majority and in opposition, that strengthening Parliament is good for Georgian democracy. The rest. Let the Commission work, let them come out with conclusions, and we will, we will accept and we will adopt. And I think it's a good way to resolve this long-standing issue of years and years of continuous dispute, what is the place of President and what is the role of the President in the political life. I mean, this is a very civilized and democratic way to decide, to solve, and to, I mean, remove that issue from our agenda. The second issue, which also has a long-standing history of uh, disputes is an elec election code and in general election system and election environment in the country. And again, I mean, what, 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 what we offered was to set up a working group to invite representatives of all interested political parties, to invite civil society and NGOs, to invite international organizations who work on elections like Council of Europe, like OSC, like Venice Commission, and to sit down and jointly reach a compromise what could be the best election model for Georgia and to jointly update and change our election code in a way that it is much better in, in, in terms of meeting international standards. And that group is working as well. And I think that's another good example of how, how issues can be resolved in a civilized way. Because what was happening previously was that, I mean, political parties, you know, going to elections and later boycotting results of elections saying that our electoral system and the electoral environment is bad and then boycotting results, which I think is a very wrong way of changing things. I mean, if, if political party boycotts the results and doesn't recognize results of elections, it means that we basically the political party boycotts voices, votes of its own supporters, which is not the right thing to do. So the right way is let's sit down and let's do it in normal civilized way through the process. And I hope that this working group will come up with concrete recommendations in November so that this comes to Parliament in November and we will be able to adopt these amendments of uh, electoral code before end of year so that we have first test which is local elections in the end of uh, spring, in the end of May 2010, which means that if we adopt these amendments before the end of year we will have enough time to, uh, to, for, for training of officials and for implementing this recommendation. So that will be the first test. And the intention is to approach these local elections in a way which will be acceptable for everybody. Of course, I, I, I'm not naive, and I don't think that everybody will be happy. And there are differences, clearly. I mean, there, is, there are two blocks of questions, one technical and second political. In terms of technical questions, there are no contradictions, and everybody agrees that there are some technical shortcomings in our election code which should be fixed, which should be corrected, and those are recommendations of international organizations as well, and that's, that's very clear. When it comes to political side, then we may have differences because there are some parties who, for example, I mean, think that a single mandate constituencies system is better for the country. There are other parties which think that the multi-mandate regional list system is better for the country. Both systems are 
very much de perfectly democratic. And it's a matter of political taste, and it's a matter of which party likes which system, because obviously parties prefer systems where they have higher chances. So, I mean, we may not agree with everybody what is the best system for Georgia, but two conditions. At least it should be democratic, and second, it should be accepted by majority of political players. So if we have a system which is democratic and which is accepted by a majority of players, I think that this group meets its objective and it is successful. So this is second example, these two major reforms, constitution and uh, election. And there are also a number of other initiatives. I will not go through in details. If you, if you ask me, I can, I can answer it later. Just to explain you, the main philosophy behind all these initiatives, like inviting opposition to attend the National Security Council meetings and to participate in decision making and some other things, you know. The major idea of these initiatives is to create an inclusive system. Because so far, you know, the traditional polarization, which I mentioned, in Georgian society and political elite, this polarization is, is, is uh, very dangerous for the country because this polarization means that there are people, there are political parties, groups, who feel that they have no place in the system, who feel that they are cornered or they are marginalized, and then, you know, they start to act in a very decisive and radical way. There should be no kamikaze, and I, I once called this kind of parties coming at the politicians because they feel they have nothing to lose and they can just blow up the system for the sake of their own interest. And I was then criticized by opposition. Well, being kamikaze is not bad itself, but in politics it's dangerous. It's dangerous. So we don't need this kind of political groups. And the only way to have political stability is to have an inclusive and open system where every political party will have its place. And the main idea, main philosophy behind all those reforms which we're doing now is exactly creation of open political system where every party will have a say and every party will have a place. And, I mean, to help you understand why we do that, I mean, we're not afraid of strong opposition because UNM as a national movement, as the uh, ruling party or majority party is very strong. And that is confirmed by all opinion polls and just recent opinion poll conducted by Gallup International confirms again that UNM has a very strong position in the, in the country, and it remains the strongest political party far away of any, any, any competitor. So we're not afraid of competition, and we're not afraid of strong opposition. What is dangerous for the country is cornered opposition, opposition which feels that they have nothing to lose, and they can do everything, including crazy or radical things, just for the sake of their own survival. That is dangerous, because that can damage the country. So, I mean, the objective is to attract, to bring entire spectrum of opposition inside the process to open the system, to create inclusive system, so that, I mean, this is the precondition. So openness is precondition of stability. And only way to achieve this openness is through reforms and through increasing rights of opposition. And we understand it. So basically, by, by strengthening opposition, we make system more stable. And by strengthening opposition, we strengthen ourselves, because we are also part of that stable system. So I think that's good to understand why we do it. These are not reforms for the sake of reforms. These are not reforms for me to come and report to you that we are doing something so we are good guys. I mean, we are doing that for our own sake. Because by opening this system and by making opposition stronger, we make opposition more responsible as well. Strength never comes alone. It always comes with responsibility. And responsible and strong opposition is not, enough, is not dangerous for the country. It's good for the country and it's essential element of political balance in the country. So that's, that's the philosophy. I will not go into, into some other technical description of reforms. If you are interested, I can tell you later. And very briefly, because I'm, I'm already too long, I'm afraid, uh, the security, which remains a main, main challenge for Georgia. And security is related to few factors. One is, of course, the Russian presence on Georgian territory and on occupied territories, and there, I'm afraid, there is no uh, much progress, or there, there is no progress at all. And basically, the French Foreign Minister, Mr. Uh, Mr. Kushner, who was in Moscow about months ago, he, in his statement, he very openly made an assessment that Russians uh, failed to implement the ceasefire agreement, which was signed on 12th of August, and that was signed, by the way, by Russian President Medvedev as well. So basically, Russians failed to implement their own commitment under the signature of their own president. And it's, I mean, a uh, very simple judgment because, for example, this ceasefire agreement obliges Russia to withdraw troops from both territories, from Abkhazia and South Ossetia. What we see instead of withdrawal, we see 
build up, military build up, and we see installation of permanent military bases. So, I mean, it's very, very easy judgment that Russians not only not implement this agreement, but they act in contradiction to that agreement by, uh, uh, by, by installing military bases, by building up permanent military presence in both regions, by increasing number of troops. That is all contradictory to the ceasefire agreement. So the one key objective of international community and of Georgian diplomacy is to start implementing the ceasefire agreement, which means gradual reduction of Russian troops on both territories, which means beginning of political uh, negotiations on the security modalities uh, of, of, of these two territories, and that it gives ground for further progress. Because without beginning of demilitarization process, no, no, no political negotiations can be um, uh, successful. And there is also another component of that security, not, which is related not only to occupied territories, but which is related more generally to Georgian-Russian relations. And, I mean, uh, there is a, from, from what we see in public debates in Moscow, there is a very strong sense of unfinished business uh, in Moscow when it comes to Georgia. And we see a lot of public debates on Russian media outlets, on TV, you know, among politicians, among high-level officials, talking all the time that basically Russia ha ha has not met its objectives vis-a-vis -vis Georgia. So Georgia is still there. These crazy Georgians are still Western-oriented. They still want to join NATO. They still want to allow Americans to come to the post-Soviet space, which is Russia's exclusive area of influence. So at the end of the day, Russia's objectives are not met. And there are a lot of discussions in Moscow, public discussions about that. So the way how Russia should solve Georgian problem, and this is their definition, to solve Georgian problem, is they invented a very interesting definition, which means desovereignization of Georgia, which, which if further explained, means uh, I mean, division of Georgian state into few sub-states, which means that there will be no Georgian state any longer, but there will be few Georgian sub-states, few Ge regions, like, for example, if California or Texas and New Jersey, I mean, if, if U.S. was desovereignized into, into, into 50 states, I mean, something like that. And then all these sub-states will, will, of course, uh, on, based on their goodwill, join Russian uh, Federation. So that is the final solution of Georgian problem. I mean, however naive or however out, outdated or however stupid it sounds, it's a matter of, I mean, discussions and debates in Moscow among very high-level uh, politicians, well-known politicians and high-level officials. So that, of course, leaves a lot of uncertainty, sense of uncertainty in Georgian public and in Georgian leadership as well. So what should we expect from Russia? And that's the key question now, how to secure Georgia from this sense of unfinished business in Russia and from the temptation in Kremlin to finish this business and to bring this business to the end. That's the key question. And there are few ways for that, of course. I mean, one is the well-known path to NATO integration. Second is strengthening elements of bilateral security and bilateral cooperation between the United States and Georgia. So that's the ongoing question, and that's the question which we now discuss with our allies and friends, and that was one of the main points of my discussions here, here in Washington. And why this unfinished business? I'm very briefly, and I finish with that, I'm sorry. Uh, there are two main reasons why there is this sense of unfinished business. One is related to energy. Because basically, despite this uh, military operation last year, basically Russians still do not control the energy supplies through Georgia. And geographically, Georgia is the bottleneck. So if one controls Georgia, it means that automatically Azerbaijan is cut off and Central Asia is cut off. Because for Azerbaijan and Central Asia, the only alternative way how they can supply their gas and oil to Europe, not via Russia, goes to Georgia. So we are a tiny country, but because of our location, we really serve as a bottleneck for that. So if Georgia is uh, controlled, it means that this alternative route is controlled, and it means that Azerbaijan is automatically cut off together with Central Asia. So it's very important if one wants to strengthen the energy tool and, and, and energy leverage over Europe, controlling Georgia in that sense is very important. And the second reason of this unfinished business is related to political credibility, because in the post-Soviet space, you know, the relations, Russian relations with neighboring countries is very much based on the sense of fair, I mean, respect generated by fair, as they define it, and, and, and on the understanding that if any post-Soviet leader openly goes against Moscow, he will be punished immediately and he will have problems. And that's the model how Russians act vis-a-vis -vis 
uh, all post-Soviet countries, but here is the bad example for them. Uh, that they see that Saakashvili, I mean, well, openly went against Russia. There was even Russian-Georgian war, and this guy is still president. I mean, this guy still talks about NATO. This guy still, I mean, travels to Washington and New York. So why then other leaders should be afraid that they cannot survive? I mean, if Saakashvili survived, why not Aliyev? I mean, why Nazarbayev cannot survive? Why should then they listen and obey to what, what, what Russia says? So in that sense, Georgia is a very bad example for, I mean, bad example under Russian definition. is a very bad example for other post-Soviet countries. That country and political class can survive even after war with Russia, and that's a very bad example. And that's one of the reasons why there is this sense of unfinished business in Moscow and why they want to finish this business to demonstrate to everybody else that what they promise they deliver. And you rem may remember that Mr. Putin pub publicly promised to hang Saakashvili, you know, by certain parts of his body, which I will not repeat, I mean, what Mr. Putin publicly said, but basically he, he failed to do it. And this failure influences his credibility in the eyes of other post-Soviet leaders. So, I mean, that's one of the reasons of unfinished business together with energy and together with other factors. So, I mean, securing uh, Georgia, I mean, from possible aggressive steps from the side of Russia is the key objective now. And this is what worries me mostly, security. Otherwise, I think that in terms of internal development, country stands on the right track. And if we manage to deliver concrete results out of all the reforms which we are conducting now, in a few months, I think that country will be in a much better shape internally, in terms of internal stability. I mean, economically, we're doing fine. We have minus two GDP this year, but it's relatively good compared to what the risks were and compared to other countries around us. So politically and economically, I think we are on the right track. So number one concern remains security. Security related to Russian illegal presence and security re related to the sense of unfinished business in Moscow. And how to secure country from both threats, this is the key task and this is one of the reasons of my stay here. So thank you very much. I was too long. As a, as, a, as a good politician, I always talk as much as possible until audience allows me. So usually we use hammer and ring in parliament to stop people, but you know, the moderator is kind enough not to have neither hammer nor ring. So I, I, I overused my time. Thank you very much. And questions? I knew I forgot something this morning. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Mr. Bakranza, thank you very, very much for very. Uh, yeah, please. Uh, I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Okay. For a comprehensive and indeed graphic um, description of the, challenge, some of the challenges that George is facing today, uh, I first of all want to acknowledge Ambassador uh, Hotelia uh, from Georgia, who is, uh, and thank him for uh, allowing us to host this event and also acknowledge that he is our boss. And when you tell me that it's time that you have to go, then we, we will conclude this. Um, I'd like to take the uh, prerogative of the chair to ask you the first question, if that's all right. Sure. Um, and it's in the, uh, the, security, the security realm. Um, the Russians have been having a lot of problems in the North Caucasus uh, in the last, last few months, a lot of incidents and terror, terrorist acts. And, uh, and once again, they've been uh, making accusations uh, about Georgian um, harboring of al-Qaeda and terrorist mercenaries, et cetera. Uh, this, uh, this story has a familiar ring to it, and it's uh, some, uh, a pattern that you had to deal with uh, quite a bit uh, six, seven years ago uh, in your capacity in, as, as head of uh, security issues office in the National Security Council in Georgia, and before that uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs when uh, this dynamic and, and the kinds of accusations were coming from the Russians quite a bit. Um, uh, those, alleg those allegations have, of course, been uh, uh, vehemently uh, uh, denied uh, uh, by the uh, by Georgians, including yourself. Um, what I'm wondering is whether uh, you uh, see any evidence of uh, the increase or return of foreign fighters and foreign involvement in the northern in the northern Caucasus itself, uh, not ones that are you know using Georgia, but whether that is an element that is uh, contributing today to the ch uh, increased uh, instability uh, in the region. Uh, okay, thanks. I mean, yes, the, the, there is this uh, old story again that Georgia harboring terrorists, you know, 
uh, fighting against Russia in Northern Caucasus. I mean, however naive this uh, kind of statements sound, I mean, in reality they are dangerous for us because, I mean, we, we know that these kind of statements can create a pretext for Russian action against Georgia. So in that sense, they are very dangerous. I mean, of course, there is no cooperation between Georgia and Al-Qaeda and cannot be because we have been fighting against Al-Qaeda in Iraq with a full brigade size force for five years and now we're deploying our battalion in southern Afghanistan. I mean, that's the most dangerous area where there will be fights between our guys and Al-Qaeda uh, people. So, I mean, fighting in Iraq and Afghanistan, I mean, fighting there, we cannot be harboring Al-Qaeda in Georgia, of course. I mean, that's, that's nonsense by definition. But why Russians do it? And it's not Russian politicians or state Duma members who are relatively free in their expressions. The people who made these accusations are, I mean, Russia, for example, Mr. Patrushev, who was eight years FSB director and then now is the Secretary of National Security Council. So he's a very high-ranking security official making it. So why? I mean, the reasons are simple. A, Russia has to explain why situation in Northern Caucasus is very close to explosion again, because many, many times President, Prime Minister, other Russian officials had said that Northern Caucasus is no longer a problem and that is solved and that is resolved and this is the most peaceful part of Russia since the end of the last war in Chechnya. So now they need to explain why it happens again. And the situation in Northern Caucasus is very bad. It's, it's just at the edge of explosion, especially in Ingushetia. It's very tense. There are daily shootings. There are daily kidnappings. There are daily attacks against uh, policemen or other, or, or other, I mean, representatives of local government, and there are daily skirmishes between governmental forces and these uh, rebels or rebels or boyviks or any way you define. So they have to explain why it happens again. And of course, who is guilty? Of course, not Moscow. I mean, somebody else should be guilty. And whenever they look around, who is guilty? Usual Georgia is the uh, usual suspect for that. So I mean, that's one to explain to internal public why it happens again. It's, of course it's because of these bad Georgians, I mean, not because of mismanagement from the side of Moscow, you know, not because of the fact that they subcontracted the power to local criminals like current president of Chechnya, you know, who, who is just assassinating people by order, not because of other mistakes they did there, but it's because of the Georgians again, of course. It's a very easy way to explain to public. And the second reason is that, and that is the most dangerous for us, that they keep creating the enemy from Georgia. And that's very dangerous for us, because by these kind of statements, by permanently keeping Georgia as enemy in the eyes of internal Russian public, basically they create a pretext and justification for their possible aggressive action against Georgia. And we usually know well how that is done, and the first stage of Russian aggression is always preparation of internal public opinion. And these kind of statements serve as a preparation of public opinion, so there is overwhelming public opinion in Russia that Georgians are enemies, so they had a war with us, you know, they organized genocide against our citizens, now they uh, shelter terrorists who, who are blowing up houses and killing people in Northern Caucasus. So I mean, to create this image of country which is dangerous for Russia, so that if Russia makes any aggressive action against Georgia, everybody internally will applaud that, yes, this was important and this was a good thing to do. So, I mean, these two reasons, why it happens and keeping Georgia as a, as, a, as, as a Russian enemy, these two reasons, I think, make this kind of statement dangerous. I don't think that there are, I don't have, I mean, precise information, but based on what I know and what we have, I mean, I don't think that there are significant number of foreign, I mean, uh, people in Ingushetia or in Dagestan. I mean, unlike 1998, 1999, when they really had a lot of people coming from uh, uh, Gulf countries, coming from the uh, Middle East and fighting there against Russians. Unlike that, now we have no evidences that there are a lot of people like them. And I think all these people are busy fighting back in Afghanistan and Iraq. And by the way, we contribute for them being busy fighting there. So. So, I mean, these people now have no, no resources and no time to come to Russia or to come to Ingushetia for that. So I don't think that this time foreign participation is a key factor. I think that it's really the internal problem. It's a problem because, I mean, the way how Russians managed to stabilize Northern Caucasus for a few years was that they subcontracted power to local criminal leaders, and they gave them full authority to do whatever they wanted to do for the exchange of being loyal to Kremlin. 
But when you create this system, this system at the end of the day, in few years, of course, generates a lot of instability and problems. And I think Northern Caucasus is approaching now that point. I cannot say that it makes me happy. No, not at all. And last thing which I, w I want to see is war in Northern Caucasus and war next to our borders. Of course, we prefer to have stability there. And that's, by the way, one of the points. And we continuously have been offering to Russia to cooperate on Northern Caucasus, to have stability in Northern Caucasus. But unfortunately, Russia has been continuously ignoring our offer. And I still believe that the biggest foundation for Georgian-Russian common interest and cooperation may be cooperation on achieving stability in Northern Caucasus. That's our natural interest, our and Russian. Unfortunately, you know, that has been always ignored by Russia, you know, because they, they, they were seeing their primary objective as playing zero-sum game against us and playing zero-sum game against you through us. So they, they have been always ignoring our offer to help them in, in, in Northern Caucasus. Okay. State in Central Asia. Thanks very much. It's always uh, a very direct and uh, candid uh, uh, statements that you all make from, from Georgia. Appreciate it. My question is this: While you do not know what's going on with the Constitutional Commission, what is, in your view, the importance of the judiciary in the balancing that you, you were describing? Are there issues on the table regarding the judiciary? And I don't mean to suggest an imposition of the U.S. sense of, of, uh, <laughs> of balance between three branches, but you made more reference to the balance between the legislative and the state. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, yes, I, I, I cannot know the details uh, what the Commission says, but in general I said that uh, making Parliament stronger is an overwhelming, I mean, political consensus on that. And, of course, other segment where there is political consensus is that ju judiciary should be independent and strong. But I will not say that, that that is achieved in Georgia already. I mean, I will say that, I can say that a lot has been done in that direction, but I can also say that more remains to be done because, you know, changing judiciary is much more difficult. It appears to be much more difficult than changing ministries or executive because basically what we had in 2003, it was the failed state, failed state, and it means that if there was a corruption in the ministries or in government or in parliament. It was the same level of corruption in judiciary as well because everything was corrupted and everything was part of the same system. But when we started to change, it's much easier to change ministers. It's much, much easier to change ministries and people bureaucracy rather than changing judges because that's an independent system and there you face dilemma. Either you continue having the old judges who are discredited and corrupted or you intervene and change, but then you intervene into independent judiciary. So it's a dilemma which should be addressed very carefully, and it takes usually much longer than, than, than transforming ministries or changing ministries. And another reason to that is mentality. And that should be the perception matters a lot. When it comes to judiciary, public perception matters a lot, how people see judiciary and whether there is trust or not. And there is still a lot of mistrust towards Georgian judiciary in, in public. So that's, that's the area where much remains to be done. But I think we created, legally we created foundation for that because legally we made, I think, very important uh, uh, guarantees for judicial independence. For example, previously, you know, President was chairman of uh, Council, High Council of Justice, and Chair President was appointing judges, first and second instance judges. Now we completely removed President from that process, and now they are judges themselves who make every decision, and it's Chairman of Supreme Court who appoints judges and who makes disciplinary decisions. So President is completely removed from that. We adopted a law on ex parte communications, which means that judge who receives a call from public official or from, I mean, prosecutor or even from attorney trying to influence his decision on a concrete case under consideration, the judge is obliged to declare this call and there are sanctions against the person who, who called. And now we are introducing further amendments into this, call, into this law and it will be criminalized. So, I mean, especially against public officials. So if public official, high-ranking public official calls to judge and tries to, I mean, influence his or her decision on specific case, there will be up to three years of imprisonment for that public official. So, I mean, legally, 
we made, I think, very right things. But when it comes to real life, it's a very difficult system to change. It's very difficult perception to change. For example, now, you know, on the business disputes between state and uh, between tax inspection or state and the private enterprises, in this business disputes, majority of cases, state loses majority of cases. But in public perception, you know, state always wins. And there are a lot of things which should be changed. I mean, I, I don't say that, I mean, what, 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 what we are doing is always 100% right, but I believe that all in all, the reforms and especially legal guarantees which we give are made in the right direction. Then it's up to judges themselves to feel how strong guarantees they have and they should be independent. And it's up to public perception which can be, which is changing in that sense very, very slowly. So judiciary is a very much work in progress. Richard White's Hudson Institute. Thank you. You gave a very comprehensive review of uh, recent domestic developments in Georgia, actually going back about two decades, and a, a helpful summary of your current relations with Russia. Did, uh, since you're in the United States, since you're the only dialogue with the uh, Obama administration, I was wondering if you would just give us an overview of how you set your, your relations with the uh, administration. Uh, well, I think uh, uh, the uh, there is clearly there is a continuity on Georgian policy in, in, in the United States, and that is something which we, of course, very much appreciate, and not only appreciate, but which is, uh, I mean, instrumental or existential for keeping Georgia as a sovereign country. And these main elements of this policy have been designed in early 90s when Georgia became independent during the first term of uh, President Clinton, you know. So that's when this policy started. Then it was further developed. Then it was picked up and developed by... President Bush and his administration, and now we have every reason to believe that it will be continued and further developed by, by President Obama's administration. Because when I was here last time, I had a lot of, uh, I mean, myself, questions to ask what will be the main principles of foreign policy and principles of U.S.-Georgian relations for the new administration. Now I no longer ask those questions because at the level of principles it's very clear. And President Obama himself, Vice President Biden, Secretary Clinton, they made very clear statements on many public occasions, both publicly and I mean at the working level, that Georgian policy will continue and supporting Georgia will continue and no other policies will take place at the expense of uh, abandoning Georgia. I mean more specifically the reset and there were a lot of questions how uh, improving relations with Russia will influence uh, Georgia, but uh, you know, fortunately, even after reset, not every program is deleted in the computer. So Georgia is one of those programs which was not deleted, and so we, we are still there. So at the level of principles, there are no no questions, and it looks it looks I mean, excellent. Now, when we come to below principles on the concrete details, how this cooperation will continue. I mean, how this assistance will continue. There are still some questions. There are not, 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 not every detail is so far elaborated. And we understand that elaborating detailed policy, it's, it needs time. And you know, one should not expect that Georgia, Georgian policy will be the top foreign political priority for US having a lot of challenges around the world. So I mean, still this is an ongoing process. And one of the reasons of my being here today was asking these questions about details. What happens below those principles? What are the specific details? What are the specific ways how this support is materialized or institutionalized? So it's a work in progress. And I hope that within the next few months, it will be finished as well. But again, what matters is that at the level of political principles, this assistance and cooperation remains. We have signed a special charter on strategic cooperation this January. Now we are working how to implement this charter, and I think it gives a very good ground for look, look, looking optimistically on those relations. And again, these are not just foreign affairs issue for us. This is an issue which has, I mean, direct influence on Georgia's security and direct influence on Georgia's political development. So this is something very, very, very important for the state of Georgia. Yes. Hi, Christina Jeffers, National Democratic Institute. Uh, when you spoke about the changes to the electoral code, you said that the key litmus test would really be if the new system was democratic and accepted by a broad spectrum of the political players. Now, today's Georgian media is suggesting that the new ele direct election of mayors 
will take place only in Tbilisi and through a winner-takes-all system. So my question to you is, is this a step backwards from Saakashvili's promises? And do you think that, that the new system will meet the litmus test that you laid out of being accepted by a broad spectrum of, of opposition parties in Georgia? Okay, basically I failed to say that NDI is playing a very important role in that. If I knew that you were in this, in this audience, I would say that from the beginning. But NDI really did a lot, you know, in mediating between among different political parties. So uh, I, I can say immediately that a uh, winner-take-all system will not be there. I, 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 will, I don't want to go into details which may not be uh, understandable or familiar for the rest of the uh, I mean, audience, but the winner take all will not be there, and uh, I mean, there is no problem as of the system of direct elections. So, what happens is that we have a system when uh, uh, city council is elected, and then elected city council elects the mayor. And that is the system which exists in many European countries, especially in Central and Eastern Europe. I mean, majority of countries have a system like that elected council elects the mayor. But now, you know, we are working so from the viewpoint of democracy. This system is not less democratic than direct election at all. And it, this system works in many European countries, let me repeat again. But now what we are working on is that there was a one long-standing issue, opposition demanding direct elections of Tbilisi city mayor. So what's the difference? I mean, Tbilisi is the center of Georgian political life, and Tbilisi being a center is a most critical constituency in Georgia. So uh, uh, opposition feels that they have higher chances to win elections in Tbilisi if it is direct elections of mayor, but not the system which is now, I mean, council and then mayor. So. Again, it's not a matter of being democratic or not, because this system is exactly as democratic as the other one, but it's a matter of political reasonability, whether we should do or not. And basically we said that we agree with that, because if opposition wants to play by rules, which is more favorable for, for, for the opposition, we take that challenge. And that's part of the offer which I said that we are designing steps how we can make opposition stronger and how we can increase opposition's participation in the political life, increase their strengths and increase their responsibility. So we basically agreed to play by their rules and we agreed to have direct election of city mayor in Tbilisi. But it does not mean that the system which is in other cities is bad or is undemocratic. It is democratic and it's a matter of political reasonability. And because of political reasonability, because of having more engagement of opposition into political life, we made a political decision to agree to change the system in Tbilisi, but it does not mean that it obliges us to change the system in other cities as well. So it's a, it's a process, and it's a matter of political reasonability. And I cannot exclude, and I do not exclude, that after having direct elections in Tbilisi, at a certain point, we may come we may change the system and move to the same model in other cities as well. But the fact that we will do or will not do it at this point does not mean that that, that other system is not democratic. No, I mean, both systems are equally democratic. And it's a matter of political reasonability. We accept that challenge in Tbilisi because if opposition wins direct elections in Tbilisi, that will, I mean, significantly change the political landscape in the country because Tbilisi is 35% of population, Tbilisi is, I mean, almost 80% of GDP and financial flows. I mean, Tbilisi is the political center, so directly elected mayor of Tbilisi is a very powerful man in the country. So if opposition wins that, they will have a very, very powerful position in the country. And, I mean, we took that challenge. But, again, it's a matter of political reasonability. Whether, which model will be accepted by majority of political parties, I cannot say right now, because there are ongoing consultations back in that group. So we will see. We will see what happens there. Okay, we have time for uh, one more question. We'll move back over to the left side here and the uh, a woman in the, the back, in the pink, please. Thanks. Thank you. Susan Allen Nan at George Mason University. I wanted to ask if you could connect your emphasis on dialogue and your emphasis on security. Uh, and is there room for a variety of multi-track sorts of dialogues engaging the Abkhaz and the South Ossetians, even while the Russian troops are still present? Uh, well, uh, I mean, um, uh, we, we see the development of this process as a kind of two-track uh, um, two track movement. One is related to Russia, and second is related directly to 
uh, Abkhaz and um, South Ossetians. So I think that both tracks should, should, should move simultaneously. But of course, I mean, let, let's be realistic. I mean, until and unless Russia starts implementation of ceasefire agreement, Russia starts demilitarization of these territories, and there is elementary conditions of choice for the people living there. Because what happens right now in both territories, basically it's a one big military camp, especially in South Ossetia. It's heavily depopulated area, which is converted into a one big military camp. So, I mean, one cannot speak about freedom of choice for local population in, in, in these conditions, and especially in the conditions when ethnic cleansing was conducted and majority of population had been forced to leave their homes. So there should be general framework and security framework which would allow people to express their free opinion. Otherwise, in the heavy military presence, illegal presence, and in the realm of ethnic cleansing, you know, this freedom of choice does not exist. So what should happen? Again, the first step should be, I mean, the implement beginning of implementation of the ceasefire agreement, gradual withdrawal of uh, Russian troops, uh, introduction of international observers on occupied territories, and beginning of negotiations. And that all creates a better, much better pretext, which makes other track realistic, which is track of direct communication with Abkhaz and Ossetians. I mean, we are working with them now, but I, let's let's be realistic, and I mean. It, let's not be naive that at this point this track cannot generate any result. We just have to keep these relations for the better future and we are through these relations now we are keeping certain ground for the better future but until and unless this first issue, Russian issue is addressed, you know, this second track cannot generate any result. But we are working again and now we, government is preparing a special strategy on communicating with Abkhaz and Ossetians. Government is working on that. They asked our friends to be involved, international friends, to be involved in that process as well. So I expect that by the end of year we will have a comprehensive strategy of communication with uh, people remaining in Abkhazia and South Ossetia. So that strategy will be in place. We are also working, especially with our European friends, on some confidence building measures. So that all happens. But in order that to bring to positive results, we need to address Russia, because otherwise it would be not noticing the elephant in the room. Mr. Pakradza, on behalf of the CSIS and all of our guests here in the audience, uh, let me express my thanks to you today for opening the dialogue with us. And <clears throat> I think also everybody in Washington is grateful for the lovely Georgian weather, which you have brought here to us this week. We wish you success in the rest of your meetings here in Washington and uh, good uh, safe travels back to Tbilisi and success in your work there. And we look forward to continuing the dialogue here again sometime soon when you come back to visit. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you.